Well, good morning. So uh, my name is Brad Bowers. I'm one of the organizers here for B-Sides Philly. Uh, first off, thank you for joining us for another year. This is our second time around. Love to have it at Drexel. Uh, hopefully this is convenient for everybody. I know how hard it is to get into the city first thing in the morning, so we appreciate you being here. Just a couple quick logistics that I wanted to provide everybody. Uh, so restrooms, right outside this door to the left. Uh, there's restrooms, or if you go straight down to through the hallway, there's another set of restrooms down there. Vending machines, lunch course will be coming. We'll scrape up on that, get some coffee out front or tea. Uh, so Wi-Fi, you will see an AP. Actually, you're going to see a whole bunch of APs. But uh, focus on the ones that say Drexel, and of course, like any other con, be careful what you connect to, right? The one that has been provided to us is called Drexel Guest. The user ID for it is B-Sides, and the password is Dragon12828. Get it today. Uh, CTFs, there's a couple going on. So we have the IoT Village. Guys, if you haven't checked these out before, they are completely awesome. These are the same one that you would find at DEF CON or any of the other really major cons. We're very, very fortunate to have them. So uh, check it out. You'll find them over in the vendor and breakout room next to us. The uh, other one is point three. Point three has one that you can do in the room. You can do in the hallway. You can be at home and working on it. They've set up a set of different challenges going from very, very easy all the way down the path to hard. So if you feel like having some fun today and breaking out and just trying some of the different pieces, have at it. Uh, they look really, really cool. Uh, other pieces I want to talk about, your badge. So these badges are something we've been trying to do for a while. These are a lot of fun. You'll notice if you bring up your phone that they're broadcasting in AP. They are not only hackable, but they are also a challenge. So you can get into these badges. You can figure out how to get the information from them. During lunchtime, we'll do a little breakout session and we'll talk about uh, a little bit about how the badges work, how we've put them together, and how to go through the challenge. When you're done, use these for home. I am right now running this to open my garage door opener, to open my kids' lights, uh, doorways outside. They've been rock solid. Use these Wemos to, to use for your Amazon Alexa or your uh, Google Home stuff if you have it at, at the house. Great pieces. Uh, what else do we want to say? Uh, Gary Fails put these together. A ton of blood and sweat have gone into it, so uh, have some fun with them. They're uh, pretty cool. Other challenges. So you'll probably notice in the front you, there's a postcard. So i uh, make sure I don't get the names wrong here. Ryan Donahue and Nick Ganya. I apologize if I botched the name. These are our first little crypto challenge. They're designed to be done relatively simplistically in a day. Check them out. If you have any questions on it, hit one of the staff members or somebody with a black shirt, and we'll square you up and uh, show you how to do it. But uh, they look like they'll be a lot of fun. So other logistic pieces around 11 o'clock, 11.50, excuse me. After that presentation, we will have uh, that little break in between that period and lunch. We'll have some sp sponsors come up to talk to you about some of the services that they got, those that are looking to hire uh, people, visit them next door. Uh, in fact, you know, spend some time with them, guys, because here's the bottom line. If it wasn't for our sponsors, we wouldn't be here today. They are who make this possible for us. So just going down the list, Comcast, Security Risk Advisors, Access IT Group, Drexel, TrekPoint, Susquehanna Investment Group, Radware, uh, CrowdStrike, F5, NSA, Point three and Noah Starch, all of them have given us resources to be able to put this together, to be able to feed you, to be able to give you these cool badges, and to be able to give you prizes. I want to talk about that. So a little bit about prizes. If you did not get one of these handouts, grab one. It is important. The back of this is what we are calling B-Side Bingo. And what that is is spend a little time with our fine sponsors next door, drop off a resume for the ones that are hiring or anything along those lines. But if you get their mark, their initial, their scribe, whatever it may be, at the end of the con, right before our uh, little happy hour with beer and wine, we'll be doing a drawing for two iPads. They're 128 gig iPads, brand new 2017, and an Amazon Alexa. So get the markings off the back. 
there's anything you have a question about, hit us up. We'll be able to set you up and make sure that you have what you need. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. What else are we going to talk about? This special thanks to a few folks here. So, Garrett Fails in the back, the guy who put these badges together. Ryan Knox, Dave Perillo, Chris Maynard, uh, Mike Mullet. These guys have put in a ton of personal time. And they do it for no reason other than to put a con together. Nobody gets paid. None of us make any money out of this. We simply do it because we want to give back. We believe in what B-Sides is about, that low-cost, no-cost kind of conference where we can bring people like Lieutenant Colonel Wong here, who's going to talk to you uh, about the uh, things that the NSA may not be telling you completely. And uh, you know, in order for us to be able to do these things and to have an environment, it's really what this whole thing is about. So please spend some time with your peers, network as much as possible, talk to the sponsors, mingle with everybody, make this as best as we can. So with that, I will uh, hand her over to Lieutenant Colonel Ernest Wong to give you our keynote speech. Guys, thank you. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. So when Brad asked me to give the keynote speech here, I figured, uh, yeah, 9 o'clock keynote speech, not a problem. Then he told me it was 8 o'clock, and then I'm doing volunteer duty in the afternoon, so he's got me running multiple duties. Uh, I'll be a wrangler at the end uh, in the afternoon, so uh, uh, you'll see me in a different colored shirt. Uh, just a quick show of hands here in the audience. Uh, who's former military? Uh, I know Brad's Army. Army folks? Army? Okay, we have a few Army folks. Navy. Oh, we have a few Navy folks. All right. America's game going on tomorrow, all right? Okay. Air Force? No Air Force. Darn it, I make fun of the Air Force in this video. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, they're probably in the next room. I should be asking them to come to these seats up here. I actually, you know, in the Sun Sea, they say, uh, keep your friends close, but uh, keep your enemies closer. So if you're any Air Force folks, we have some uh, front row seats for you. Uh, Marines. Any Marines? Yeah, good. Uh, Coast Guard? FBI? NSA folks? Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Um, as Brad mentioned, I actually am working from an institution called the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, anyone know what that is? Even former military folks? Yeah, okay, we have someone that knows what the Army Cyber Institute is. Uh, what we really are is we're located at West Point, New York, co-located with the United States Military Academy, so 50 miles north of New York City. And uh, what we do is we're like a think tank. And we're trying to hopefully uh, give our, not just the Army, but entire government uh, an understanding of what the future threats will be. And that's really what I'm talking about for this, this talk, innovating uh, for the 21st century warfare. So cyber warfare is really what I'm talking about. And the subtitle of my talk is, sometimes I call it, I know someone who's been to B-Side Rochester, I gave an earlier version of this talk in some of these conferences, uh, I usually call this uh, thinking inside the box, uh, but I'm trying to get our military, really I love coming to the B-Sides and all these hacker conferences, uh, because I really do think that this community is already thinking outside the box. So I hope this talk resonates with you, uh, with what you're doing, and hopefully if you're not. Any students in the audience? Yeah, great. For the students, this is really what I want to encourage. For the students, hopefully this encourages you to think outside the box in a way of doing so. I'm giving you a framework uh, for how innovation sort of works and uh, try and promote more of it, better innovations, and more importantly, more successful innovations. Uh, so hopefully that's what you get out of this talk. Now. I normally do not introduce myself. I will introduce myself as the slides go on, uh, so you'll get a feel for my personality and my likes and dislikes. Uh, but the Army Cyber Institute, uh, just a very quick recap of what we do. Uh, here's our current mission statement. Uh, we started in 2012, so from a start tech startup point of view, yeah, that's ancient, right? Five years ago, that's ancient. But for government time, hey, we are still a startup. And actually, we have um, a new director. Colonel Andy Hall is our new director, and he's proposed this mission. Uh, not too different, right? Things in blue I've highlighted, our current mission impacting, in, trying to do impactful partnerships. We understand that in the cyber cybersecurity, the military government can't do it alone. In fact, we need industry, we need smart folks from academia to help. Uh, because we know the problems of cyber, cybersecurity, it's not just one industry that's going to be impacted. It's not one organization. It's not one agency. It's really the uh, safety of the entire nation. And that's why it's important. Now, building intellectual capital, uh, 
Most of what we do, right, NSA, they try to keep things classified, right, a lot of those offensive tools, offensive techniques. Uh, at the Army Cyber Institute, we published. Uh, what I'm doing here, outreach, trying to get this information out to this audience. Uh, we partner with and we tell folks that we partner with, we're going to publish as much as we can. Sure, do we abide by non-disclosure uh, non agreements? Sure, but we try to tell our, our partners that we're going to publish. Uh, with our new mission, our proposed mission, still a lot of the same things, conduct interdisciplinary research. It's amazing. You would think that for an Army Cyber Institute, we'd have a whole bunch of computer science, electrical engineers, mathematicians. I'm a systems engineer. We have a two lawyers in our organization. One's teaching ethics, one's teaching cyber law. We have a historian. We have a psychologist, a behavioral uh, analyst. And we have two social studies uh, type of folks, policy folks. Uh, so we're really trying to bring together, right, not just the tech, but the non-tech as well. Because we believe really the solutions for this future really are going to be the meld uh, between two, not just technical solutions. And really developing innovative solutions enabling uh, cyber resiliency for our nation. Uh, what the key thing here is that uh, here's a picture of our organization. We are just outside of West Point itself, outside the gates. Uh, this is called Spelman Hall. And uh, for those, anyone been to West Point, visited? So if you've been to West Point, this is right outside, it's outside the gates, and it's Lady Cliff College, the former land of Lady Cliff College. They uh, fell into financial troubles in the 1980s. Uh, West Point took over lands. And so when we have startup tech companies coming to visit us, and we tell them we're five years old, but they, we tell them this is our building, and this is uh, the old Lady Cliff dormitories. So all these tech CEOs, CISOs, CIOs, they come visit us. They tell us, hey, you guys are in a dormitory, a ladies' dormitory. You guys are still a startup. It's worse. Actually, one of my colleagues calls it, it's worser. Uh, we're undergoing renovations right now. Yeah, governments, right? Uh, we're undergoing renovations. We're actually outside this building in the parking lot in trailers. So it's worser, right? We're still a startup. Uh, again, in tech field, in tech years, uh, we're old. But uh, for government business, we're still brand new. And so when I think of innovation, I don't think of it as this one monolithic entity. I break it up. Any business majors in the audience? Yeah, so if, you, if you're a business major, right, you know you can break up the world, any problem, into four quadrants. So that's what I've done here. Okay, so on my, on my uh, x-axis, right, I'm a system math guy, I'm system engineering. On my x-axis, I'm calling this technological sophistication or complexity of the innovation itself. Okay. On my y-axis, I'm looking at who the targeted user is, whether it's an existing user, right? That's most, most businesses are talking existing users, but there's this notion of talking, targeting new users, underserved users. Okay. And so when I look at this, when this in, from quadrant system, on this low tech side, existing markets, I call this sustaining innovations. Meeting existing customer needs. And really, it's the biggest customers. That's who it really is. You're targeting the biggest customers, the most profitable, the highest margins, right? Business school teaches us that, right? Don't worry about the low margin folks. There's a problem with that as we go through this briefing now. On the high tech side but existing customers, I call that incremental or evolutionary, right? Think of Darwin, evolutionary type innovations. It's high tech, right, but still targeting existing users. All right, these two quadrants actually tend to be the most innovations. Okay, and we're going to see that as this presentation goes on. What about on this new new markets? If I want to go high tech but new markets, I call this breakthrough innovations. Okay, or jump in the curve. I'm going to come back to this notion of jump the curve uh, in the in the brief little while. So I hope you get a better sense of what that is. But what about this side, this notion of new markets, underserved markets, but low tech solutions. Does that even exist? Do we even call it innovation? I do. Okay, I call that revolutionary innovation, right? Being here in Philadelphia is great, right? The birthplace of our nation, right? Revolutionary War, right? 1775, 1776, uh, Constitutional Congress right here in Philadelphia. So I call it the revolutionary innovation. It's also known as disruptive innovation. I'll get more into that in a little while. Uh, but I call it revolutionary innovation for a reason. Uh, if you're beside Rochester, I think I call it disruptive innovations. I'm calling it revolutionary innovations from here on out because I think it makes the uh, distinction a little clearer between breakthrough and, and revolutionary. But the, 
problem is when you think about innovations, right? Most the, most folks really, and again, I tend to give this talk to military folks. Most folks in the government, right? We like to think of high tech stuff. Yeah, there's the only the only innovation in the world is from the high tech stuff. There's no low tech stuff that's innovative. What's worse, right? What's worse? They go to the breakthrough side, right? Lots of government folks, lots of CEOs. Right? I know we have a lot of CISOs in the audience. We have a lot of IT folks. When, when have you had those CEOs latch on to that bright, shiny object? Right? It says it's going to solve all your cybersecurity problems. And the government does that. Right? That's the way we think. Okay? And that's the problem. Because right? if you start just looking at that breakthrough innovation, that's only one quadrant. That's one-fourth of your innovation. Okay? And I'm going to tell you it's, it's worse as this presentation goes on. I'm trying to get our government leaders to understand that yeah, revolutionary sustaining innovations are possible as well. Okay, looking to the past, not just to the future, not to sci-fi, but to fantasy and prop into the past. Okay, George Washington crossing the, uh, what was that, Delaware River, Potomac? What was that? Delaware? Okay, yeah, just down the, down the, uh, down the street, right? Down the river? Okay. But so perhaps we can get some innovation in this side, some low-tech innovations. Do you believe me? Everyone in this room should be saying that. If you're a hacker, you're doing low-tech innovation. You might think you're doing high-tech, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to convince you, hopefully after this talk, you're doing low-tech innovations. But I really want our government leaders to understand this. Okay. So if now if I understand this box, okay, from a military intelligence, I'm a military intelligence officer. Okay. So when you think of military intelligence officers, all right, I'm not a cyber officer. Cyber's a new branch. The Army Cyber Institute, where I came from, gave a lot of resources, a lot of white papers that developed the cyber branch. And that's what I'm trying to do here, try and talk about innovation. When I think about sustaining innovations, I'm thinking about Spock. Right? Any Star Trek fans here? Yeah, good Star Trek fans. So when I think of Spock, right, he's giving Captain Kirk, right, the Enterprise, the most logical, the highest probability of success uh, types of courses of action. Right? The recommendation Spock gives is going to give thee the highest degree of success. Right? So Spock is, for me, the caricature for sustaining innovations. A lot of efficiency gains. What about evolution? Any Mad Magazine fans? Okay. Yeah, it's still online. So, so if you want to read the uh, Spy versus Spy. So evolution, or Darwin, is talking about right the white spy is trying to kill the black spy. Right? In evolutionary types of innovation, all you're doing is trying to one-up your next best customer or competition. That's all you're doing. Right? And over time, right? White spy is trying to kill the black spy. Next issue, black spy kills the white spy. And that's this whole notion of Darwin, Darwinian, or evolutionary types of innovation. What if we go up, though? Breakthrough. Breakthrough for me, right, what's defining breakthrough is James Bond. And for me, the quintessential James Bond that's breakthrough is Pierce Brosnan. Right? He's got all the gadgets that the core master division, Q, uh, from the United Kingdom out of MI6 gives all these resources uh, you might say Daniel Craig, right, he's trying to go revolutionary, especially in Casino Royale, right, not a whole lot of tight tech gizmos, right, a lot more fist fighting, right, but come on, last three James Bonds, what, it's Quantum Solace, uh, Skyfall, and what was it, Spectre, come on, he's got all the gadgets, right, so he's, he's breakthrough as well. So what about revolutionary? Do we have revolutionary types of innovation? Does it even exist? Do we have a spy that's... Can you think of a spy that's using what's at his disposal to save the day? Come on, with this audience. MacGyver. Yeah, so for the young, the students in here, the students, if you don't know MacGyver, there is a reboot on right now. There's a reboot. So you can watch it. I hear it's not that great. But you can get a sense of it. Okay? Now, if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch all the other episodes. They are cheesy, but you can watch MacGyver, right? He's saving the day with what? Paper clips, duct tape, whatever's in his pocket, right? Chewing gum, right? He's disarming missile. He's disarming a nuke with, with chewing gum and his Swiss Army knife, right? He's got that Swiss Army knife. It's amazing. That should be an American Army knife. It can't be the Swiss Army knife. This is an American Army knife. It's American, right? American Revolution. We have all these uh, disruptive revolutionary type of inventors. Okay, so for the kids in here, all the students, if you don't know MacGyver, you should know Jason Bourne, right? 
Jason Bourne is saving the day, right? He's saving his life. He's saving his girlfriend, whatever episode it is. It's a different girlfriend every time. Uh, with wherever's at his disposal, right? It's that mini car that swerves to the right a little bit, right? It's got the little clutch, right? Sticks, pens, right? He's using whatever at his disposal. Now, one of these characters really is not a military intelligence type of character, right? Even as much as I like Star Trek, as a military intelligence officer, Spock really doesn't fall in that, that uh, doesn't really give us that same analogy. So, by Spock, he really doesn't fit there. I'm thinking, right, Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible is doing some pretty good stuff. But I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking Tom Cruise Mission Impossible. Right, because Tom Cruise, can you hear that? I'm not thinking Tom Cruise Mission Impossible, because Tom Cruise Mission Impossible, he's up here, right? He's breakthrough. Even in, even in, uh, what was that, uh, the fourth one? What was that? Rogue Nation, right? When they get disavowed, they've got high tech stuff. In this one, right, he's climbing that highest tower with a glove, that high speed glove that can stick like Spider Man. Sure, it fails a few times. It fails a few times, but that's the notion of, dis of breakthrough innovations. They can fail. Okay, same thing with revolutionary innovations. They can fail. Okay? Now, again, I, I say Mission Impossible because I'm not thinking Tom Cruise Mission Impossible. I'm thinking the original Mission Impossible, the original IMF forces, the Mission Impossible Mission Forces back in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, so Spock, right? Leonard Nimoy, he played Paris. Now, again, for the kids in the audience, go to Amazon Prime. All five, all five seasons are there. It's excellent. I recommend watching all five episodes, all five seasons, because you see disruptive innovation, or you see sustaining innovations in action. Because really, it's not just Leonard Nimoy, right? The entire Impossible Missions forces, look at them, all five seasons. A lot of great actors here, right? Got Sam Elliott, got Leslie Ann Warren, uh, Barbara Bain, Martin Landau, a lot of great actors. Peter Lupus was a strong man, right? Really, all these folks, they're playing a con game on foreign nations. They're playing con games on uh, criminal organizations. So they're using their wits to outsmart their enemy. I call that sustaining types of innovation. Because really, all these folks, they actually played actors while they're actors on TV. Right? They're using their own skills as acting to con these governments out of their secrets or to influence and do certain things. Now, the nice thing with the Mission Impossible also is they actually span all four sectors. Remember Barney? Now, again, if you're the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible, it's uh, Simon Pegg. So they're the they're the high tech guys, right? They give they give the Mission Impossible team the uh, all the high tech gizmos. But again, if you watch the old episode, Barney's electronic right listening devices, high tech at the time, they fail, right? Same thing with Tom Cruise's uh, glove, it fails. It's not 100 percent perfect. That's the whole notion of targeting new markets. They can fail sometimes. Okay, they do a pretty good job, but they fail sometimes. Now, the bosses, do you remember the boss from the original Mission Impossible? Uh, Peter Phelps? Right, I guess it was in Mission Impossible 1, the movie. It was played by John Voight, he turned bad guy. Well, Peter Phelps, right, he's evolutionary, incremental, because he's always looking at who the threat is. Now, by looking at the threat, he's assembling his best team for the, every episode. Right, threat at the time. So he's taking the best actors, the best skill sets to combat the threat. Now I'm also looking at before before uh, Peter Phelps. There was uh, any Law and Order fans? Yeah, we have some Law and Order fans. Stephen Hill, the original DA in Law and Order, he was the original Mission Impossible's and Impossible Missions Force director. Right, so he was the one that assembled this team. At least he is the one. Okay, so that's, that's in this case, revolutionary disruptive, because he's assembling this team, right? He's making use of these actors. He's probably got some dirt on them, right? Yeah, that's why they're working for the IMF. They're not, right, they're working for peanuts and they work for the government. Even if it's a, even if it's a black clandestine organization, right, what works, it's government organization. They, they've got budget constraints. They might have had, uh, what, uh, Budget uh, impasses back then as well. Yeah, it always happens. Okay, so again, I told you, any, we do have some Tom Cruise fans in here, right? 
No Tom Cruise fans? Come on! I'm a, I'm a Tom Cruise fan. I, I still like the Mission Impossibles. Not so much Jack Reacher's, right? Jack Reacher's, er. That is, that is actually a revolution. He's not doing a lot of high-tech stuff there. But if you remember, there's a Tom Cruise movie where he actually does revolutionary innovations. Can you think about which one it is? Someone already figured it out. I normally have to play this intro. I have to play the intro. Yeah. Yeah, you can have to figure it out now, right? Right. I have to play this intro because I would not have believed it myself. When I saw this intro, it forced me to do a little bit uh, more digging, a little more looking back in history, right? A little of that revolutionary type of innovation, looking the history. <sighs> this is actually giving me a break as well, talking. So, right, when you see Tom, Tom Cruise, it's really when you see Kelly McGillis, right? When you see Kelly McGillis, yeah, it's Top Gun. But really, it's this one right here. Yeah, it's part of the intro. Now I'm going to blow it up here. <coughs> so in March of 69, the U.S. Navy, right? We have some Navy folks here. I'm going to give some props to the Navy folks here. Okay, so hopefully by the end of this lecture, end of this presentation, you're supporting the Army folks for tomorrow's football game. So, so the Navy, right? Yeah, go Army, beat Navy. I've been teaching my nephews that, three and five-year-olds. Um, the Navy in 69, they started the school. The amazing thing is when I look back at the history, uh, Benjamin Lambert wrote a, wrote a great book, uh, Transformation of American Air Power. One of those pivotal moments was the Vietnam War. In 1968, I would not have believed this. I didn't read this, right? Our, our notion of history is sort of distorted by what we see in the media. Did you realize that the U.S. government suspended air operations in 1968? I didn't know that. If you read through that, we were losing so many aircrafts, we were losing so many pilots that uh, the Department of Defense said we can't sustain this. The, the Soviet Union is going to kill us in the uh, air supremacy. It's not bad, though. Look at the ratio that we were achieving, right? The ratio of Russian or Soviet killed to U.S. 3.701 prior to 1968. It's from 1965, 1968. Again, a lot of these were secret operations. But 3.701 is good. Right? Normally, if three, three to one is what military officers are looking for, uh, for a 50-50 chance. 3.701, that's good. However, what was the problem when we're looking at the Soviet Union? When we put our incremental hat on? The Soviet Union was based on mass. They had about ten times as many fighters and pilots as we did. We couldn't sustain it. So the Department of Defense stopped air operations for about a year. 1968 to the start of 1969, we suspended air operations. And while during that year, we're trying to figure out how do we outsmart, how do we outwit, how do we outcompete against these Russian fighters, these Russian MiG-17s and MiG-21s. We had the F-4 Phantoms. Well, the Air Force, the Air Force, where are the Air Force? Yeah, we don't have Air Force guys. Oh, we do have an Air Force guy. Yeah, I want you to sit up front. I like the Air Force. I like my enemies close, right? The Air Force, what does the Air Force always do? Well, they, they always want the best equipment, right? High tech. The Air Force went high tech. They said, Department of Defense, if you want us to increase this ratio, we need better thrust on our F-4s. We need faster jet propulsion. We need weapon systems, longer range, so we can start targeting those MiG-17s, MiG-21s before they get in their range. Shoot them down before they target us. That's the Air Force mentality, breakthrough. Right? Breakthrough innovations. What did the Navy do? Training. Right? The last time the Navy had dogfight experts was World War II, 1945. Vietnam War, 1968, 1969. We had lost the art of dogfighting. So the Navy said, we're going we're gonna to come to the school that was called the Fire Weapons School, more affectionately known as Top Gun. But the amazing thing is, look what the stats were. When they resumed operations in 19, late 1969, early 1970, the Air Force suffered a little bit, right? As a mathematician, it was statistically insignificant. It actually went down. It went to a 3.6 to 1 kill ratio, Russians to U.S. Okay, about the same, even though they had better weapon systems, right? It improved F-4s. But look at what happened. What happened to the Navy? Any, any guesses? 
Any guesses? Yeah, up, but how much? This is crazy. 13 to 1. That's crazy, right? Even if you're, even if you're, my math is off, right? I'm actually getting from Benjamin Abbott, but even if his math is off by a factor of 100%, right? Still looking at 6.6 .6 and a half to 1. 13 to 1 ratio. And what's even more amazing, did every pilot go through Top Gun? Remember Top Gun, the movie? Did every pilot go through Top Gun? Who went to Top Gun? The best of the best, right? The best fighter or the best crew from each squadron went, right? So if you remember the movie, was Tom Cruise the best fighter in his squadron? Not initially, not in the opening sequence. Who was the best fighter? I don't have his call sign up. It's Cougar. Cougar was the best fighter, right? But he got PTSD because in that opening sequence, right, they were doing that uh, combat air patrol, and that Russian fighter lock, had missile lock on Cougar, and he had PTSD. It said, ah, can't go to Top Gun, right? He resigned his commission. So the captain of that air, air carrier, that squadron, said, all right, Cougars, I mean, Maverick's going to be it. Right? He hated it, right? Maverick. It's Maverick, right? He wasn't a team player. So he had to send Maverick and Goose, right? They sent Maverick and Goose to Top Gun. And again, so the amazing thing is the best fighters, so not all fighters, the best fighters from each squadron, right? And it was about an eight to ten week course. In eight to ten weeks, what was the rationale? Well, the Navy figured we send the best pilots. When they get back to their squadrons, they'll teach the other pilots what they learned. That's what happened in Vietnam. All the pilots who went through the course, they taught the rest of the squadron the dogfighting techniques they learned. 13 to 1. Amazing. That's revolutionary success. Okay. This notion, yeah, I really haven't talked about a box yet, right? I told you the alternate title was thinking inside the box. But right, it's a square, right, with only two axes. What do I need to do to make this a box? I have my college guys. What do I need to do to make this a box? Just add, yeah, add a z axis. Add one more axis, right? You you've been out of college for a while, right? Oh, I'm sort of disappointed in college students here. That's okay. It's still early in the morning. That's okay. It's late for me, right? It's late for me. There's the uh, army saying is we get more before done before nine o'clock than most people do all day. I have a corollary to that. I get all my work done before 9 o'clock. So the rest of the day, I'm free. After this presentation, I'm free. No, no, no. Brad's got me doing uh, Wrangler duty after this. Oh, yeah. So again, still not from a mathematician's perspective, but if I add one axis now, offset potential, the notion that the innovation can change, drastically change the environment. Well, what are those? From these four, from these four quadrants, what are the innovations that can actually change the environment the most? What's well, the top two? It's revolutionary and breakthrough innovations, not sustaining an evolutionary. Right? Sustaining an evolution, you're targeting your existing markets. You're just improving slightly just to capture that market share for, for the existing markets. For new markets, underserved markets, right? If it's successful breakthrough or successful revolutionary, you're going to change the environment. So when the CEOs are writing those books on how to do innovation, right? Apple is writing IDEO, they're writing books about innovation. All those business school guys, they're reading about, ah, do innovation. They're not talking about sustaining an evolutionary innovation. That's why this framework is important. You have to be doing revolutionary breakthrough innovations. You have to be targeting new markets, underserved markets. Okay? So this is a more represent representational view. Again, still no numbers, right? I tell my cadets that I teach, you gotta put some numbers on there. Okay? At least, at least, uh, scale-wise, it's a little more representational. Now, if I change this offset potential to a different uh, axis, I'm now going to call it probability success. Which innovations give me the highest probability success? Well, it's got to be the bomb tier, right? You're targeting existing markets. You can do market research. You can get bank financing, right? Banks don't like to finance, right, something that's new. You can't do market research off that. Banks don't like that. So we're, right? This is actually the more recitational view of what it will look like if I call it probability success as that third axis. Okay? So if you want to be doing innovations and have higher probability success, do the bottom two. Don't do the top two. Right? Lots of failures associated with the top two. Again, still no numbers. Right? I told you. I told my cadets. I got to give me some numbers. Well, let's look at a case study. All right? Give me some numbers. Anyone remember what happened in 2010, 2011? Still recent history, just about five years ago, five, six years ago, seven years ago. It all started with Tunisia, 
right? The police confiscated, uh, the army police, Tunisian police, they confiscated the wares, right? The fruits, the vegetables of this vendor on the streets. I don't know what the reason was, but because of that, that vendor set himself on fire. He self-emulated himself, right? That's tough, right? To take away your livelihood. And that sparked, right? That sparked, amazing. It sparked the 13 other other protests. Sure, there were other things going on at the time. Again, with a cyber audience, we should remember WikiLeaks, State Department, U.S. State Department cables got leaked. All these embassy folks, ambassadors telling us, ah, we, we're working in this country, but these kings are kind of corrupt. Right? When the people of Tunisia, people of Algeria, people of Morocco, Egypt, they read those cables on WikiLeaks. They said, yeah, if the U.S. thinks they're corrupt, my livelihood's suffering. Yeah, they're corrupt. We also had this thing called Twitter, right? Even though a lot of these government agencies were shutting down media, Twitter sort of helped uh, spawn and spread the uh, this revolutionary, right? Revolutionary types of thought. So here's a nice way of looking at the, the numbers. Anyone remember who uh, actually succeeded the revolution? Uh, yeah, Egypt somewhat, but the first was Tunisia, the where it first started. Uh, in, a few, in a few days, 24, 72 hours, that king fled, right, when the protests erupted. Egypt, right? Someone said Egypt, right? Wow, I've got, I gotta get my stickers out. This is like an A plus student here. Uh, Egypt, we had Yemen, right? Yemen's still fighting, right? There are a couple of revolutionary factions still fighting each other in Yemen. Uh, we had, uh, Libya. Those are our four. Anyone else? Any other countries? Who's fighting right now? Syria, right? Syria's question mark, right? Because it hasn't succeeded yet. The government's still in power. They're fighting. I, the reason why Egypt, I have a question mark, not quite revolutionary. So who took over in Egypt? The army took over, right? Aziz took over. So when we call, when the army takes over, we call that not a revolutionary success. We call that a military coup. As a military officer, right? Remember back to our forefathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, all those guys. They didn't like a large standing army, other than George Washington. George Washington wanted a big army, right? Because he wanted to fight the British with a regular force. But uh, when the war was over, we as Americans don't like large standing armies. So if you look through our history, anytime there's a war, we drop down in numbers very quickly. World War One, drop down. World War Two, ramp up, drop down. Desert Storm, drop, right? We, Americans, we don't like large standing because of this. We know that militaries have the resources, they have the training, they have the equipment, they have the leadership to conduct a successful military. They can take over, militaries can take over governments very easily. We see that around the world. South America, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa. Okay. So when going back to the Roman history, when the Caesar's Roman legions are crossing the Rubicon, the Roman Senate does not like that, right? They like it when Caesar is fighting the Britannica, right? UK right now. He's like, they like it when they're fighting the barbarians in Germany. Yeah. When Caesar's army comes back to Rome, that's bad news for the senators. And right, it was true, right? Caesar took over. Um, so the, again, the question mark right now, well, these are the numbers, right? I tell my cadets, right, never make a general do math in public because if they do it wrong, you're never going to convince them their numbers are wrong. So I tell always, tell, do the numbers for them, right? Do the math for them. So in this case, a uh, very quick showing about 21%, right, for successful revolutions. Again, Yemen is the question mark. I mean, not Yemen, Syria. Syria is the question mark. We don't know if the revolution is going to succeed, right? The U.S. is supporting the revolutions. Not ISIS, but some of the revolutionary forces. Russia is backing Assad and the Syrian government. I study a lot of counterinsurgency warfare. Uh, it's not looking good for the U.S. and the revolutionary forces. Uh, once, because as this presentation went on, you're going to find out why, right? I'm giving you some insights in counterinsurgency warfare from here. Because once the government responds, it's bad news for the insurgents. So now we have some numbers, right? It's about 20% successful. Again, you might have different 
uh, thoughts, right? Some might think single digits, some might think uh, decimal places. But for me, I kind of like to think of this as uh, major league batting averages. That's that's a nice way of looking at it. If you're doing pretty well if you're at 30%. You're doing pretty well if you're at 20%. You're doing very well if you're at 40%, right? So try to get to 40 Try to get to 50%. How do we do that? Well, understanding this framework will help out. Okay? Because here is... Right? Here's the problem, though, with the... Uh, the Hollywood gives us. Hollywood gives us the impression that revolutions are easy. As Americans, right, we think of revolutions are easy. War, war for independence, 1776. We beat the British out, right? We beat them again in 1812. The problem is, and again, for me, the Patriot didn't really work out. I actually, I actually like Star Wars. Hey, I told you I was a Star Trek fan. I'm also a Star Wars fan. So I'm equal opportunity. I just really don't like, um, I'm not a big fan of Doctor Who, though. Great premise, right? The doctor keeps reincarnating. But the, I actually like Star Wars. So if you're a Star Wars fan... Yeah, we have Star Wars Episode 4, and I guess Rogue One was Episode 3.8 or 3.9, whatever. So pretty much the same premise. But actually, this is my favorite movie from Star Wars. It's Episode 5. Because when the Empire figures out a revolution is going on, that's why they came up with the Death Star. They came up with the Death Star. So the Emperor and Darth Vader came up with the Death Star because they don't want to deal with rebels one at a time. If they suspect there's a rebel base, they're going to obliterate the whole planet. Who cares about the civilian casualties, right? That's the right thing to do. If you are, if you're in this evolutionary space, you're going to obliterate the entire rebel forces all at once. That's why it was so important for Rogue One and uh, uh, Star Wars New Hope to defeat that uh, Death Star. Right? That was a game changer. That's a game changer. Now, here's another way of looking. Instead of looking at in the quadrant system, right? look at his timeline. So in this case, I told you that... Uh, the, it's not that there's no innovation taking place in evolution and sustaining. I, I told you there is innovation. It's just at a slower rate, right? The rate of change is just slower compared to breakthrough and revolutionary, right? On the breakthrough thought, I call it jumping the curve, right? Because this notion is that the innovation jumps off what the existing market is expecting for the innovation, right? It jumps off the curve. And really, the folks who actually study disruptive innovations, which I'm calling uh, revolutionary innovation, it's a couple of Harvard Business School professors, right? Joseph Bauer and Clayton Christensen. Uh, it's mostly Clayton Christensen. He's done a lot of books on disruptive innovations. Right? It's this notion that you can actually have a crappier product, right? This is actually a crappier product if you look at it on the timeline, right? It is performance is terrible. Right? It's below the green line. It's below what people expect. And, but the notion that Joseph Bauer and Clayton Christensen are the said was that, you know, sometimes these crappy products, they succeed. And not only do they succeed, they displace the monopoly force that's in the green. Is that possible? Come on, everyone in this room should be saying yes, right? We're hackers. Yeah, of course it's possible. Well, how about some, uh, some examples? This notion of revolutionary innovations, right? It's appealing to emerging markets, appealing to a small segment of the market, usually the individual. As a hacker, we are doing things for ourselves. We don't like what the Microsofts are doing. We don't like even what these vendors out here are doing, right? We configure it to our own personal tastes. We hack it. Now, here's what it is. It's initially far worse on at least one area. At least one area. Usually two. But here's the thing. If it's successful, the newly valued criterion proves at such a rapid rate that it will overtake, right? If it's successful, it will overtake the companies in green. Some examples? Yeah, Bitcoin might be. Yeah, I would, I would say Bitcoin is probably a good example. Is it going to displace currency? They said credit cards would displace currency. We still have currency. I'm not sure if it will displace currency. Mobile phones? Oh, you're stealing my thunder. You must have heard my presentation somewhere else. <laughs> let's go with, let's go with Xerox versus Canon first. What did Xerox focus on? Xerox is green, right? They're the, they're the monopoly power in terms of photocopy machines. I know the college students, you might not remember this, so I'm relying on the old timers 
What does Xerox do? Copiers, but how big were they? Huge. They were the size of this room. You, universities and Fortune 500 companies, they had print divisions. Some of them were bigger than the R&D divisions, right? Print divisions. Because back then, if you wanted staples, if you wanted a hole punch, if you wanted collated, you had a big machine to do it, and you had Xerox do it, right? Every time a Xerox, right, some customer, the big customer, university, wanted something else, right? They went along the line and cared to the big customer. They didn't care about the small customers, right? We're selling million-dollar copiers. I don't care if you're a mom-and-pop store. We don't cater to your market. Underserved market. So who do Canon cater to? The mom and pop stores. The home-based business. Was there a Canon's copier crappy? Canon's copier was crappy, right? It was those inkjets? Crappy copies, right? Xerox laughed when they saw those smudges. Right? Xerox laughed at Canon when they, they were bringing out and go, ooh, the paper quality is terrible. Your, your, your copier is jamming a whole lot more than ours is. Right? So Xerox laughed at Canon. You should be, okay, I'll hold on to this. What about this one, right? Everyone knows about this one. Would IBM focus on the 1970s? Mainframe, right? We've got a mainframe. We're going to cater to the universities, Fortune 500 companies. Same thing, right? If you want our services, you want competing power, come to our mainframe. Punch cards, who remembers punch cards? If you got those punch cards out of order, I didn't do punch cards, but I always had... Uh, a professor tell me, yeah, they tripped all the cards off out of order. It's like in your term paper out of order. Same thing, right? Doesn't collate, uh, doesn't compute. What did Apple focus on? Same thing, personal computer, right? Just like Canon, it's the personal market. Was Apple's Apple One, Apple Two E terrible? According to IBM, it was. Who would ever want to buy this crappy, right, personal computer? that has one-fifth our computing power of our best mainframe. Terrible, terrible system, right? But it appealed to an emerging market, the personal home-based user. Cost, cost was the factor, right? $1,000 PC versus a mainframe that costed hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now here's not a non-tech example. The big three automakers versus the Japanese imports. This happened in 1979. Anyone remember ha what happened in 79? Yeah, Iran, gas, gas prices. Uh, you might say we're having some of that right now, right? Uh, we'll see. Um, so the big three, the big three American automakers, they focused on power, right? Large vehicles. They didn't care about fuel economy. Gas shock forced us to go to the Japanese vehicles. Quality was not initially a forte of the Japanese automakers early on, right? It was not quality. We think of Toyota being high quality now. It's fuel efficiency. As they went up the curve, as more and more people bought the Japanese cars, then quality improved. Then it overtook the big three. Who's overtaking Japan now? This is amazing. That this, this took, the, the key is the Hyundais, right? The South Korean companies. They're nipping at, the, right? We can say the Japanese companies are on the green line now. It's the South Korean vehicles, right? Their quality has improved drastically. Improved. Who's nipping at the South Korean companies? It's amazing that this cycle keeps repeating. China, a company called Cherry. Also, India. There's a company called Tata. Okay? We don't know if it's going to succeed, right? I told you, revolutionary innovation is tough to do. At best, 30%. Major, major league batting average. But, this cycle sort of repeats. That's the notion of what the Bow and Christian study. It's amazing, right? These guys in green, you'd think they have the mar market power to crush these guys in the red. They, they ignore that market. They ignore that market to their peril. That's the way this notion of revolutionary innovations is kind of powerful. Game changers. Someone said, cell phone? I'm looking at it slightly differently. Blackberry versus the smartphones. What was Blackberry's key feature that they had to have in their other phones? The keyboard. They were wedded to the keyboard. Because their primary users, their best users wanted the keyboard. What did iPhone focus on? Simplicity. No keyboard. Did you ever see a grandparent with a Blackberry? Few and far between. You see five-year-olds with iPhones. You see grandparents with iPhones. Simplicity is really what it was. Then they became uh, tailorable, customizable. A lot of people say customizable first, but it was really simplicity was first. And again, I just want to highlight 
right? It's not that breakthrough and sustaining or revolutionary innovations are easy to do, right? 20%, 30% chance of success. If you're really good, 40%. Might try to get it 50%. If you understand this framework, you might try to bump it up. I can give you examples after examples, but I got the five minute mark. I'm going to be doing his job pretty soon, so I'm going to try to adhere to my time limit. Uh, let's see. So how do we best protect cyberspace? How do we protect cyber for cyber warfare in the future? I've been focusing on revolutionary innovations. It's not enough. We need to be doing all innovations, breakthrough, sustaining, and incremental. We need to do all types of innovation. The problem is, the problem is we've been ignoring revolutionary innovations. And as a military, we are very um, guilty, right? We're guilty of this all the time. If you look at all the wars where the military, the U.S. military has lost or, say, called tied, right, starting with the Korean War, the Chinese, very simple technique they did. MacArthur, John MacArthur, relied on wet film technology, right, for his intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. What's the problem with film technology? Wet film. You can't see it not. You need light to get the images. The Chinese, whether or not they knew it, they operated exclusively at night. Uh, MacArthur consistently underestimated the Chinese strength by a factor of uh, four. Instead of a three to one odds, he was facing 10 to 11, 12 to one odds. He was expecting three to one. It's hard to fight a ground war when you're that far off your estimates. What about Vietnam? There was this thing called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Our Air Force, right, we tried bombing the heck out of it. Right? We suffered a lot of casualties, right? We had to stop our air operation. But this whole notion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we didn't understand that the Ho Chi Minh Trail initially was just a rat line. It was dismounted infantry. If you put a crater there, what, what do people do when there's a crater? You walk around it. That was the Ho Chi Minh Trail for the first three years of the war. Sure, after the bombing campaign stopped, they did start putting roads in. So infrastructure came later. But initially, we had a mistake of think thinking we could stop the Ho Chi Minh Trail just by bombing the heck out of it. Uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. What's going on right now? Im what does IE IED stand for? Improvised. <laughs> improvised. Yeah, that's revolutionary, right? It's not even a weapon system. It's improvised. Explosive device. That's a revolutionary technology. It's not a weapon system. Improvised. That's causing casualties on the battlefield. They're essentially, initially, they were just dotted munitions from the Iran Iraq war. I was stationed there. We used to have, ah, I'm wrapping it up now. Yeah, I'll tell you my stories afterwards. Come talk to me. Cyber warfare. My contention is that nearly all malware discovered for the first time resides in that space. You can debate me on that. Sure, there are some that fall in other spaces, right? Stuxnet, I'm thinking, yeah, might be breakthrough. Yeah. But guys, here's the problem. On defensive side, we're ignoring this space. Offensive? You don't need to do breakthrough innovations for the offense. My concern is when the bad guys start doing breakthrough, we're never going to catch up. We think we're bad now. What happens when advanced persistent threats start doing those breakthrough innovations? We're screwed. Anyone doing cyber defense is screwed. Right? We're never going to catch up if we leave that space open. This is my one slide with uh, wording. So if you want to take a picture, this is probably the best one, especially for college students. You take your notes here. Uh, really, the most I think it's in the, the center part. If you're an early adopter of comics experimentation, that's the best way to encourage uh, disruptive innovation, revolutionary innovation. You can do these other things, right? You can, you can uh, merge with another company that's doing it. It's tough, though, to mix, that mixed cultures. Uh, you could be an incubator, do alliances, but really, I, uh, a lot of studies have shown that, uh, the book is by, uh, Catherine, oh, Catherine Eisenhart and Shonda Brown, a uh, Stanford professor and a Harvard Business School professor. They really studied that really being an early adopter of chronic severity is the best way. And that's how you encourage this out of the box thinking, right? I'm calling it inside the box thinking, knowing this framework, but it's courage and creativity if you do that. And so to conclude, to wrap it up, yeah, we, need, we do need to be doing all types of innovation. The problem is when we ignore, right, if we ignore revolutionary innovations, right, there's a saying in the military, we're proud to say that we are no longer a zero, we are a non-zero defects military, right? Colin Powell used to say that, right? It's bad when you're zero defects, right? Any mistake is bad. But now we say we're a non-zero defects military. I'm saying that's not sufficient. I'm saying in order to really be in the forefront of cyber warfare, 
we need to be an experimenting military. And the great thing is our cyber branch, they're, they're doing some of that. I gave a talk at the B-Sides Augusta, uh, Cyber Center of Excellence, the cyber branch down there. I talked to a bunch of lieutenants who are uh, volunteers, wranglers, and they're telling me some of the things they're doing in their class, and they're doing a lot of experimentation there, which is very good. We'll see. My contention is that we'll find out in about five to six years, because those second lieutenants, right, cyber branch started two years ago, those second lieutenants, those E5 buck sergeants, they will become the sergeant majors, they'll become the majors, lieutenant colonels, five, six years from now. We'll see if we can get the get a handle on the cyber defense thing. Uh, just to wrap it up, look at all the talks today. Yeah, we have some that are purple, right? Some breakthrough. And, but look at all the talks today. When I looked at all these titles, these are all revolutionary types of innovation. So enjoy the talks today, learn from them. And last thing I want to add, right? Submit your own talk for next year. Have the courage, right? Based on this talk, right? Not very technical. It's okay to get rejected, right? To do revolutionary innovation, 30% is the magic number. I could do a presentation on all the talks I've been rejected from. Okay? It's not quite, I'm, I'm at the, about the 60% success rate. So I'm actually doing a little, a little better. But, uh, it's tough to do revolutionary innovations. Tough to do, do breakthrough innovations. Uh, these are the Constitution Hall talks first, and then we had some uh, Congress Hall talks. So if you're in the other hall, you can't ask me questions, but uh, I'll take questions from, from you guys. It's better for being in this hall. I just want to thank, really, all my credits, and I want to thank uh, Brad, Dave, Ryan, and really the entire B-Sides Philly team for asking me out here. And that is a wrap, right? I think I'm going over a little time. Um, <laughs> if you do have questions, come see me. Uh, I'll be here for the rest of the day. Uh, I'll be the wrangler for the afternoon talks. So if you want to talk to me in the hallways, just uh, come up to me. I appreciate it. Go ahead.